what, what I want to do is spend most of my, so basically I want to talk about, you know, what we've been talking about the last couple of days, um, but really focus a lot more of this talk on the examples, because I feel like that's what's often lacking in a lot of these types of conversations. It hasn't been here, both, you know, uh, Barbara and Quentin gave really good examples, but I think that's what we need a lot more of. So I'm going to focus a lot more on examples, and I'll give you more sort of 30 seconds on, on one minute on a lot of examples and not go deep. There is both source code on GitHub for all of the examples I'm going to give you, as well as papers, more details, technical details, all available. So I won't, I won't spend time on that. Um, so let's sort of start going through some examples of applying data science for policy problems and, and problems with social impact. And I'm going to talk about sort of more policy, not macro policies, but very micro policies, because that's where I feel like data science can have an impact is really personalizing the policies as opposed to making the best global policy, it's making the best local policies. So example number one is um, um, from uh, the states where there is a huge issue right now around police misconduct and the police having interactions with the public that they shouldn't be having. And it's, it's, it's about there are 50 cities right now that are under what's called consent decree by the Department of Justice because they're being investigated for practices that uh, were wrong and they need to go fix them. Now, it, looks, it turns out that these departments have these systems called early intervention systems that are supposed to flag when officers are likely to be involved in one of those incidents, except they don't work. Right? Um, and they don't work because they've been traditionally designed by police experts who sit around a table and come up with what would predict a police misconduct? Well, if they've done something before like that, probably it's a bad thing. If people complain about them, that's probably a bad thing. If they take a lot of time off, that's probably a bad thing. You know, it's the states, right? You don't do that. Uh, so combining all of those things, they build a system, and it turns out they didn't bother either evaluating them or even seeing if they actually work. So when we evaluate these systems, it turns out they end up flagging too many people. Um, so, for example, one of the systems that we looked at at Charlotte uh, in North Carolina, which is one of the sort of the leading systems there, it flagged about 50, 60 percent of the officers, 60 percent officers. So that's already completely useless. And even then, it was only able to flag about 70 percent of the officers who were going to go on to have one of these incidents. Um, so what we did was, you know, took that same thing, got all the data about police officers, everything we could find, and I'll skip the detail, but we found that we could, by applying fairly simple machine learning methods, build something that could reduce the number of false positives by about 50% and bump up the number of uh, people who are going to go on these incidents by about 20%. Right? So example number one. Second example is lead poisoning. Um, so in the States, you know, most homes built before 1978 have lead paint in there, which is fine as long as the paint is inside the wall and not chipping and coming out. When kids crawl, they put it in their mouth. When lead goes into your bloodstream, it has horrible effects. The worst thing, all of these effects are irreversible. Once that goes into your bloodstream, it's too late. All these things happen. The policies today are, let's wait until somebody gets lead poisoning. Uh, we test their blood. If they have high levels of lead, then we go fix their home. Right? Um, pretty horrible idea. Uh, and it's basically we use kids as lead sensors because they're extremely accurate lead sensors. Um, so. The obvious uh, use of data science, in this case, to make a very simple policy change. Instead of fixing these homes after poisoning, could you fix these homes before poisoning? Um, and it turns out you can do a pretty good job. So some work we've been doing for the past several years in Chicago, we were able to say that about 20% you know, of the inspected homes, um, if you, same thing as, as uh, Barbara was showing in the, the New York, is if you rank all your predictions, and if you in, in, um, inspect and fix homes that are in the top 5%, uh, you can get 20% off the kids who are going to go on to have uh, lead poisoning. That's something that's in, uh, right now, there's an, uh, a randomized control trial happening right now in Chicago, and then based on that, it'll get implemented uh, over the next few months. Third example, which is a lot of people work on these types of issues, which is uh, it's children who need support uh, finishing school at different levels. And it turns out, you know, there are a lot of these systems in place. Um, a lot of them are, again, based very similar to the police system, where some teachers sit around and say, if they have a low grade uh, or test scores, if they miss school a lot, if they have a lot of disciplinary reactions, probably they're at risk of not finishing school. And that's wonderful, but those are, again, the one, you can't prioritize 
kids based on that. There's sort of a binary yes or no. Two is that it often flags people incorrectly um, and, and often flags people too late. Right? So one of the things we find as we work with a lot of departments, uh, a lot of um, school districts, is by using, again, data science and machine learning methods, you can do a few things better. One, you can prioritize. You can have a ranked list so you can go start allocating interventions to the right kids um, much earlier. But second thing is, not only can you be more accurate, um, but you can also detect things earlier. So one of the last um, uh, analysis we did with, uh, with about 15 school districts in Ohio, we found that you can find 10% more kids, um, but that's not who are actually at risk. But the key was you could find them four years earlier. So instead of finding them in 10th grade, um, you can find them in sixth grade. And now you have four extra years to focus on interventions and try to get them um, back on track before it's too late. Another example, um, and this is around sanitation. Uh, and this is, again, Quentin was mentioning you know, poverty. This is another side effect of, of poverty is a lot of people who don't have access to sanitation facilities. Several million people die every year because of those issues. Um, there are no toilets. And so this is some work um, uh, 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 social enterprise is doing in Kenya on putting portable toilets. And one of the challenges they're facing as they try to grow is these toilets need to get emptied uh, because if it's they're full, nobody can use them. Um, so what they do today is they have people who go every day and empty every toilet. Right? And obviously, you can imagine some toilets, when they go empty them, they're they're full, so it's too late and they've been losing you know, time and, and, and revenue. But two is if they go empty them too often, um, then they're, they're wasting resources. And in order for them to grow and put more toilets, they have to hire the same number of people. So it's basically linear. Uh, and they don't think they can, they can make it uh, financially if they have to do a linear uh, scaling. So obviously, again, what we can do here is take all the toilets and start building models to predict when the toilet is going to be full. And once you can predict that, then you can come up with a more dynamic uh, allocation schedule of pickups. And it turns out that by doing all of this, right now they're running about 700 toilets. By running all this, you can operate two and a half times as many toilets with the same number of people, which allows them to serve about 45,000 more people with the same number of resources. But now, when they add more toilets, instead of going linear, you can now go sublinear and be much more, much more efficient. Another example, um, this is in Mexico. They have a social uh, service agency called Cedesol, which is designed to provide services to all the, the people who need, who need social services. And um, the challenge, one of the challenges they face is which most social service agencies face around the world, is there are, um, in their case, it's a much more acute problem, is they think they have millions of people who are eligible for certain services, for certain types of programs, but they're not applying for them because they don't know about them. And on the other hand, they have people who are under-reporting their income, their circumstances, to get access to services that they're not eligible for. And what they would like to do is figure out both of those things. They're trying to figure out who are the people eligible for services but are not applying for them, and vice versa. And what we're able to do with some very initial work, and this is some work in progress right now, um, where we're able to look at all their data and come up with models that can predict about, identify about 7.5 million additional people that can potentially be matched with better services. Now, this hasn't been validated, so I'm not, you know, don't quote these numbers. They're gonna take this list and now design an experiment where they'll go in and do more information collection with these people to see how correct these things are. Another example is some work we're doing with the US Environmental Protection Agency as well as the New York Depart uh, State Department of Environmental Conservation around a very similar, a very common problem that a lot of uh, compliance agencies face, which is, this is around uh, regulation of uh, uh, waste, hazardous waste. So how do you dispose of that? So they have about a few hundred thousand facilities around the, the US, and they want to minimize the number of facilities that are violating some of these waste regulations. So they throw you know, uh, environmental waste into rivers or in trash cans, and they want to minimize that. They have a certain number of inspectors who go on and inspect facilities. Now, as every regulatory agency, they have many more facilities than the number of inspectors can inspect. So they have to figure out how do we allocate the, the, the inspectors to inspect uh, facilities that are in the short term more likely to violate so they can catch the violators, but in the long term increased compliance levels so deterrence effects are what they really care about. So we work with them um, 
to come up with a better inspection regime. Um, and it turns out, you know, we can, before they were sort of finding 400 violations for every 1,000 inspections they do, and we can now bump that up to about 750 violations per 1,000. Another example is around the criminal justice system, um, where US is uniquely horrible at dealing. Um, and we have about you know, 11 million people go through about 3,000 jails in the US every year. And it's, about, it's not only, you know, it's horrible in human costs, obviously, it's also bad in financial costs, but $22 billion are spent. When you look at the problem more carefully, it turns out that a lot of these people have uh, mental illnesses, substance abuse disorders, and chronic um, health problems. And so some work we've started doing recently with a lot of different uh, counties in the states is if we know these people are interacting with emergency rooms, with hospitals, with homeless shelters, with mental health facilities, can we identify those people earlier and intervene in those systems before they end up in jail? Is that even possible? And it turns out with some early work we've done, it looks like we took one county and because it just take the top 200 people we can predict. It turns out 104 of those people were going to go on to jail in the next year and they will collectively spend about 19 years in jail. Now, what we don't know is whether intervention is 100% or even greater than 0% effective. Um, and we'll, I'll come back to sort of that theme because that's the common theme across a lot of the examples I'm giving. Um, Another example, much more operational, much more mundane, it's uh, water pipe breaks. So every city has water pipes, every city has water pipes that break. In this, in, so this is some work we've been doing, we started with the city of Syracuse in New York State, which, you know, they have about a break every couple of days. And like every city, they wait until something breaks and then they go fix it. Um, and when something breaks, they have to go dig up the street, um, fix the pipe, rebuild the street, and that's expensive. So can you be preventative the same way we want to be preventative about other things? And it turns out that you actually can. So we find that, again, when we predict which pipes are likely to break, we find that in the top 1% of our predictions, which are about 50 blocks, 64% of them were actually correctly predicted in the last year. And what was funny was when we gave them this list for this year, they came back and said, uh, the, three, the top two pipes in the five you gave us just broke last week, and then there were another uh, 10 in the top 50 that uh, were off by a block, so what's going on here? Um, so that was good, you know, but we're again run, running an experiment with them, a randomized control trial to check what, what's going to happen. Um, last example is emergency response systems. So this is some work with City of Cincinnati where when a call comes in from 911, the dispatcher decides, should I dispatch an ambulance or not? They have limited number of ambulances. For example, City of Cincinnati is about 300,000 people and has 12 ambulances uh, for the entire city. Now they have to decide which ones they're dispatching an ambulance, which ones they're not. It turns out they end up dispatching, um, of all the times they dispatch an ambulance, 27% of those times, um, uh, I'm sorry, they make two decisions, sending or not. So sometimes when they send an ambulance, it's not needed. So you're basically wasting that, that, that dispatch. Sometimes they don't send an ambulance and it turns out it was needed, so they have to send it later. Which means the person who needed an ambulance is getting to the hospital much later than they should have in the first place. And it turns out 27% is, so of all the times they don't dispatch, 27% of the, those times the ambulance was needed, so they have to send it over again. So what we, what we did was work with them to predict when, to kind of build this model where you can say when an ambulance is actually needed. And based on that, what we can do is in, reduce that number from 27% to a much smaller number, which so far estimates can get about 2,500 people to the hospital much faster, which could mean the difference between their life and death. So those are some examples of, you know, there are many more examples. If you go to our website, and these are all sort of different organizations we work with on very similar projects. So you can go there, take a look at details about those projects. But what I sort of come back to is a little bit about, you know, we've all given these types of examples. You know, why, why are these examples sort of not, why are they sort of isolated cases? Why is one project with Cincinnati and one with New Chicago and one with a, a different city? Why isn't more of this work happening? And I'm not going to give you a big framework which, um, Berber gave a really good example, but I'm going to, to give you a much more simplified version. I think there are three things we're really lacking right now. Right? One is there aren't enough people who understand how to do this on both sides. Right? So on the data science, the tech, the computer science side, people don't really know what these problems are, 
and on the other side, on the policy side, they don't know what can be done, right? So it's sort of this, and how to use it, and how to consume these, these types of things. The second thing is when you go to typical government agency, and you ask them, sort of, what are, what are your problems? You know, what can I do help you with, with data? And often, they don't really have an idea. They don't have a crisp set of questions and, and, and on operational problems. It often takes a while to get there. So, and the third thing is they don't have access to tools that you can use to solve these things. Right, and compare this to um, most commercial organizations, most corporations. If you're a retailer and want to figure out pricing for your products, you go buy a pricing optimization tool. If you're a telco and want to figure out which customers are going to leave uh, churn, you buy a churn prediction product. But if you're uh, a government agency and you're trying to figure out you know, how to predict which uh, kids in my city are going to have asthma so I can intervene, you have to start from scratch. Um, so there aren't these things. So what, what's sort of needed is one is, you know, one education and training, both on the side of the tech side and the computer science and the data science side of how to understand these problems, how to scope them, how to deal with, how to solve them, and on the other side of uh, how to consume the results, how to implement them and how to scale them. Second is we need a lot more projects like the ones we've all talked about. It's collaborative projects that are not, you know, an academic sitting in a corner downloading some data, playing around with it, and writing a paper. But it's real projects, real data, um, with real organizations as partners, not as somebody who just kind of gets the result at the end. And the third thing we need is sort of reusable software and reusable data. Because without those reusable software, you're starting from scratch every single time. Right. So I'll give you a couple of examples from each of these and, and then end um, after that. Um, for example, on the training side, there are one of the programs we've been running is a graduate program. It's a joint program between computer science and public policy that is designed to sort of produce people with both of those skills because that's what we need. There are other examples of that too. Carnegie Mellon has a program um, that, that's a joint program, machine learning, public policy. Georgetown is thinking about one. NYU has a similar thing. UCL is doing something in that. Um, so there are a few other examples of that as well. A lot of the projects I talked about um, were started off in a program that we run called Data Science for Social Good that brings graduate students in computer science and statistics and math and policy and so sociology and econ and help and put them together to work on these kinds of projects with government agencies. So take a look at that. A lot of examples I'm giving are from the pr this program, and the website has a lot more details. Um, and then a lot of the, you know, the, the goal is to sort of produce people with a, on, the, on the tech side, on the computer science side, with all of these skills, right? So we typically end up focusing on um, sort of these problems over here. On the computer science side, on the stats side, or social science side, well, we need sort of a lot more skills than, than the one we typically teach um, students and typically teach people. And we need to kind of complete the whole, whole picture. The other thing is that we need a lot more research at this intersection, right? A lot of the, the work that Quentin was talking about around social science and randomized controlled trials, that's fairly data agnostic, where somebody comes up with an idea and they try that idea. Well, how do you know that a different idea would have worked better? There's a lot of data available already can you use that as priors even to figure out which experiments you should run? Vice versa, the computer science and the machine learning side you know, has figured out predictions. So we predict things and then watch them happen, uh, as opposed to trying to change things, which requires you to intersect with those two things. So I think there's a lot of work there we, we, need, to, we need to do, and some of that has already started to happen. I'll skip some of these things, but these are kind of some problem templates that it turns out all the problems I talk about fall into one of these templates. Um, the nice thing about that is that it can be used to then build uh, reusable tools, because once you can build it for one, you can continue to keep reusing these tools. Um, and then the last thing I'm going to sort of do is when you're working on these types of projects, there are a lot of common challenges that need to be considered and solved. Right? So Jim did a really good job talking about privacy, so I'll, I'll skip that. Um, security we're all aware of. But I think the last three things people have touched on over the last couple of days, um, in order for our work to get used, you have to be able to convince somebody that it's, it's right. And interpretability is a really important, not just interpretability of models that we're building, but each time we make a prediction, each time we do something, we need to be able to explain to people why that's happening so they can, they can understand it, correct it, if something could be wrong. Um, 
and then take action based on that. Right? Same goes for transparency. We want our approach or our models, our, our systems to be transparent because they affect people's lives. Uh, and when designing public policy, you want it to be transparent. Some challenges that happen with transparency is there's often this trade-off between transparency and gameability. Right? So you can game these systems if they're too transparent. So if we go back to the police example where the previous system is, if you've done, if you've had three complaints against you in a 90-day period, it raises a flag. Well, that system is completely transparent, but what we hear from police departments is their officers abuse and game that system. So if they've had two complaints against them, it's been 81 days. For the next nine days, they either don't do anything, they go park their car, sit under a bridge, um, which is obviously bad for policing as well as for citizens, or they do things, but they're much more careful. So they try to game these things. When we build more complicated systems, it may be harder to game, but we might lose transparency. So how do you deal with this trade-off between transparency and gameability? It's something we need to kind of think about. And the last piece is, you know, unlike um, a lot of the work that happens in the corporate world where if you, sh if you suggest the wrong friend to somebody on Facebook, you know, they can just exit out. But we're dealing with people's lives, and so we have to, be f have to figure out how do we put these fairness audits into things, right? So fairness is not just about are you making sure people are getting the right results, but when you're building these types of machine learning models, you have to be clear about sort of two things, right? One is they're based on historical data, and historical data is often biased because it's generated by human processes that are biased. So is your model going to just uh, exaggerate those biases and any action you take will just make it worse? Um, or do you need to correct that model? How do you evaluate a model that, that you actually deal with that way? And that's, so that's messy. But the second thing that happens is that when we measure these machine learning models, their um, accuracy or some other metric like that, what you end up finding is, hey, what if your model is 84% right? Is that good enough? Uh, I don't think so, because 16% you're wrong on, that's probably not uniformly distributed over all kinds of people. So what we need to kind of do is in build in, in our overall sort of machinery, not just audits for these types of things of what are your errors like, what are your fair, you know, how fair are you across these people, but also algorithms to correct for those problems. How do you correct for fairness and how do you make these decisions in a way that you can, they're completely open, they're auditable and, and sort of just built into these things. So with that, I, I want to end and uh, I think we hopefully have, uh, feel free to um, email me with questions or we can talk afterwards. Um, Everything I've talked about, all the code and all these things are on the website. Um, but thank you very much. Thank you.